Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship. It is certainly a joy to be up here and bring the word of God to you people today. We are, uh, we are Grace Bible Fellowship. Most of you are familiar with this place. And uh, our motto, our slogan is, Jesus Christ is man's only hope. So we keep him our only message, and we're very true to that word, and uh, that's very important that we do that, because there's a lot, of, um, a lot of false teachings out there these days, and it's always been the case, and we're going to even talk a little bit about that today. So we need to make sure that we focus on Jesus, and man, some of those songs, <laughs> they get you. <clears throat> I don't know if everybody saw last week's message or was here for Pastor Dave's message last week. Um, I wasn't. I happened to watch it from home. Um, and it was a message that I thought was very profound. I thought it really cleared something up for me um, that I've struggled with over the years. And I'm not going to go through his whole sermon. I, I urge you to watch the replay, whether you saw it or not, um, because it, I thought it was very powerful and it, and it really cleared something up for me. And I'm just going to review something very quickly. Uh, one slide. Pastor Dave is teaching through the book of Luke right now, and he's doing an excellent job as usual. And in chapter 6, uh, verse 43, it says, For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. And Pastor Dave brought up the, um, the notion about and he questioned himself, and it was something for us to reflect on, is am I a good tree or am I a bad tree? And he said, you know, am I a good tree that does bad things or am I simply a bad tree? And that resonated with me. I had to really think about that. And his, his answer really, if you, if you look at it, his answer is I'm a good tree because I've surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. Okay, that's the only reason that makes me a good tree. But I still do bonehead things. And I still think bad thoughts. And I still say, stay, say stupid stuff. Okay, now a bad tree is someone who simply does not accept Jesus Christ as Savior. Because the motivation is wrong. There's no motivation. The, the motivation is to please people or to look good doing something rather than to please God and to honor God in what we do. And the motivation is bad, and the power source is bad. They're trying to do it in their own power. Okay, so that's what I got out of that. And again, I urge you to watch it again. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because it kind of ties into what I was going to talk about today. And Pastor Dave was talking last week. I was like, hey, I was going to say that next week. Hey, I was going to say that next week. <laughs> so I had to redo my whole sermon. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> uh, so... I have a, a question for you as we get started here. Haven't seen some of you folks in a while. Some of you folks I don't know at all, unfortunately. And um, I just uh, want to ask you, how's everyone doing today? Yeah. Who's doing excellent out there today? Good. Good. Who's doing, you know, good? Okay. Who's doing terribly out there today? Who's struggling? Yeah. All right. All right. Ask me how I'm doing. I'm doing terribly. I am horrible. I am in such a bad place right now. When I was preparing this message, I asked my wife. I slept for almost two weeks straight, it felt like. I'm exhausted. The treatments that I'm under right now are just beating me up. I can't feel my feet. My hearing is going. I'm just exhausted. My mental, my physical, and my emotional state is not where I need it to be. I'm being honest. You asked. <laughs> Set you up for that one. <laughs> if, if I was to put into a, uh, an image what I have felt like for the last few weeks, it would be this, because my mind always goes to cartoons. I'm just like, I, I always think of Bugs Bunny. Just, he's, a, he's my hero in cartoons. So praise God I'm feeling a little better today. But uh, my head's in a fog. I'm a little messed up, so I don't expect much today. <laughs> um, 
But the question is this, you know, when we go through these times, when we go through these struggles, the question is, how do we handle these struggles? And this is not going to be a sermon on how to handle struggles, okay? But we do go through them. And, you know, one of the schools of thought out there in the Christian world is that we let go and we let God, right? Okay. We surrendered our lives to Christ. We say, okay, Jesus, you're in control of my life now. And um, whatever I'm going through, God will handle it. Eh, Bible doesn't teach that. Okay? That's wrong. That's a false teaching. Okay? The other option is that we work harder to win the favor of God. Well, listen, God must be telling me something. He must be saying that I'm putting you through this thing because I'm not pleased with how you're acting these days. So why don't you work harder? Why don't you put some more money in that box? Why don't you, you know, mop this floor for, for the first time in a little while? Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, the guy just did it really. I'm kidding. Uh, you know, but, but it's, it's about what can I do to please God to get him to a level that he's satisfied with my performance and he'll say, okay, now it's time for me to lift this struggle that Mark is going through or whoever is going through. Eh, Bible doesn't teach that either. Okay. Another way, which is really a good way, is to ask God for help, right? I think that's basically what, we, what we've all learned is we, we pray, Lord, I need help with something. And um, we, you know, we say, God, I, I, need, I need you to help me with what, whatever's going on in my life. But the thing with this is we need to be careful about what we're asking for, Amen. okay? So what happens is it, it, it sometimes leads us to ask for more, more of something. So for example, if we're in a situation where we need, where we feel we need more love, but the scripture turns around and says, now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. It says in Romans 5, 5. So we have the love. Amen. Okay. Or we might need more faith. We might think we need more faith, but Jesus says in Luke 17, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. We have the faith. So we're asking for more faith, but we have the faith. Or we might say, Lord, I need more peace. I'm in a messed up state of mind right now. I need more peace. Jesus says in Ch John chapter 14, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So we have the peace, okay? But we might say, okay, listen, I need more joy. I'm just miserable. I need more joy. Jesus tells us in John 15, these things I have spoken to you that my, my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. So we're full of joy according to Jesus, right? Or we might say, you know what? And this is one I was tempted to pray for this past couple of weeks. Lord, I need more strength. And in Philippians, it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Right? Yeah. So what we're doing here is we're asking and praying for something that we already have. And the scripture we're going to talk about today is 2 Peter 1, 1, 1 to 11. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I liked all the ones. That's why I put them all there. And in 2 Peter 1 to 11, it tells us that we have everything we need for life and godliness. And we're going to talk about that today. And this, the, the piece of uh, scripture that I pulled out from 2 Peter was 1.10, where it says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. That's a very intriguing and powerful passage right there. Because the first thing I'm asking is, what are these things? If you do these things, well, what things? I want to know because I don't want to stumble. And what does stumble really mean, right? So we're going to look at all of that. <clears throat> and excuse me, I'm, I'm dry from the medication. <clears throat> but one thing I want to talk about, and I think we do a really good job here at Grace Bible Fellowship, is that we need to... When we learn the scriptures and we study the scriptures, we need to do it in context because it's very easy to pull a piece of scripture out and twist it to mean anything that you want it to mean. Whatever fits your agenda or a church's agenda or a religion's agenda. 
So we need to take it in context, and we need to look today at this purpose of 2 Peter very quickly. 2 Peter obviously follows 1 Peter. Now, in 1 Peter, uh, there, were, there were believers who converted from Judaism. They stopped believing in their old ways of, of, I need to perform, I need to follow certain laws in order for me to please God to get to heaven. Okay? And they said, we understand that we're sinners and that we need to have Jesus Christ as our Savior. We can't get to heaven in our own power. And they had that born-again experience, and now they're being persecuted. Right? So he writes 1 Peter for that purpose. And I believe Johnny D did a good study Thursday night on First Peter suffering, right? Um, so that's on our channel too, gbfmc.org. Shameless plug. Um, <laughs> so the first thing he talks about in Second Peter is the second coming of. Well, one of the things he talks about is the second coming of Christ. He needed to clear that up because the people in First Peter have surrendered their lives to Christ, and there was these false teachers coming in saying. The second coming already happened. And these people are saying, wait a minute, I surrendered my life to Christ. I believed what you guys told me. I believe what Jesus told me, but I, I was persecuted for it. Now you're telling me that Jesus came and took everybody and left. Well, what am I still doing here? Right. right? So he had to reassure these folks that the second coming didn't happen yet. And he had to straighten that all out. <clears throat> now, the reason he had to do this, obviously, was because there were false teachers creeping into the church. Amen. And he wanted to warn the uh, believers of Christ, the new followers, that, uh, that there were false teachers coming into the church. And if you want to see that played out, you read the book of Jude, which is a very short book. But Peter warns about it happening, and Jude says, hey, it's happening. So, and you could also look at 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John for some information on false teachings and how to deal with it and stuff like that, too. Um, you know, false teaching has been around for centuries, for, you know, from the dawn of time. This is, the, this is right after Jesus dies, within 30 years that he writes this. And there's been false teachers, and we, and we have f false teachers today, you know. I mean, I, I think about how I grew up in a, in a, in a faith or a religion that, that taught so many false teachings. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm flabbergasted and, and pr grateful that I was, I, I read the Bible and I studied the Bible. And now I understand these truths, you know. And I wasn't even going to talk about this, but I saw this, somebody post about it the other day. I felt inspired. One of those is purgatory. I learned about purgatory growing up, where it's a place that, that you know, okay, I, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe he died for my sins. And that at some point, I'm going to go to heaven. But I was taught that, you know, there's still going to be a little sin in you when you die, Mark. So you're not going to go right to heaven, most likely. You're going to go to a place called purgatory. And people in your church are going to pray for you and they're going to give you extra money. Maybe they'll put some extra money in a box for you or light candles for you. And, you know, when the full price is paid, Jesus is going to come and get you and say, okay, now the price is paid. Come with me. You can come into heaven. That's blasphemy. That's a lie. There's nowhere in the scripture does that say that. Matter of fact, it's so wrong because Jesus paid that price. There's nobody that could pay that price. I can't pay it myself, and people can't take a collection to get me into, into heaven. Okay? And also, Jesus said uh, that every sin, every type of sin will be forgiven except the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So every sin is forgiven if we surrender our lives to Christ. It's, it's a one-time deal. And, and the only sin is not forgiven is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which is basically rejecting the gospel message saying, okay, listen, I understand about this Jesus character, but I can get there myself. That's one way of looking at it. Wow. Um, so false teachings, and, and we need to be on guard with that too. And that's why I'm talking about context today. It's very important that we study the scripture in context so we know the truths and we know the false teachings. And what we're going to talk about today mostly is that Peter describes and instructs a true believer and gives assurance of salvation. Because when we start to question, am I a good tree or am I a bad tree? It sometimes helps us, directs us to start questioning, am I saved or am I not saved? Am I truly born again? Do I truly have a relationship with Jesus Christ? And Peter is reassuring these folks what a true Christian looks like and that they are saved. So I'm going to look at the passage right now, and then we're going to uh, pick it apart a little bit. So it's uh, 2 Peter 
1, 1 to 11. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in knowledge of our God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, I knew I had it. <laughs> to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if, you do, for if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he has been cleansed of his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so that's the scripture I want to look at, but I want to look at the author first. Again, it's very important to understand the context and everything. And if you study your Bible, there's, and you have a study Bible, there's generally a, um, about the author and the, the doctrinal reasons behind it, all that stuff. It's very important to read those things. And Peter is a, an amazing character because if we look at Peter during Jesus' ministries, Peter always tried to handle uh, things in a, with an earthly approach, right. although they were heavenly issues. Okay, and very briefly, I'm going to go through what he did as examples. For example, in Mark 9 on the Mount of Transfiguration, he wanted to build shelters uh, because, you know, Moses and Elijah and Jesus were all in glorified bodies. And he's him, uh, James and John, are they like, uh, what's going on? And he says, you know, Peter, I give him credit. He tried. He, he blurts out, hey, this is great that we're here. Let's build some houses and stay here. And God doesn't even let him finish. God the Father basically opens up the sky and says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. In other words, Peter, shh. <laughs> Take it easy. Matthew 16, Peter resists Jesus saying that he must be crucified and atoned for our sins. He says, Lord, may it never be. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. He didn't understand. Jesus was telling him straight out that I'm the Messiah you say you believe that, but yet when I tell you what I need to go through, what the scriptures say, you're telling me, no, you don't want that to happen. In John 13, he resists Jesus when he attempts to wash his feet. He, Jesus comes to wash his feet and he says, you'll never wash my feet. And he says, if I don't wash your feet, Peter, you have no part in me. He goes, well, then if not just my feet, but my hands and my head also. Give me a full bath. And basically Jesus says, I already bathed you. I just need to wash your feet. And that's true for all of us too, right? The people who have surrendered their lives to Christ were good trees that do bad things. And sometimes we need our feet, feet washed, right? Wow. In Matthew 26, Jesus, um, Peter falls asleep while Jesus is praying in the garden of Gethsemane. He's there. Jesus says, hey, keep a lookout for me. I'm just going to go over here a few feet and pray to the father. And, and Peter just passes out a couple of times. In John 18, he cuts off. There's a hundred plus people around, Roman soldiers coming to arrest Jesus. And Peter says, all right, listen, that ain't going to happen. He pulls out his butter cutter and he says, he lops off Malchus's ear. And Jesus is like, easy. Don't you think I can call legions of angels from my father down to take care of this? And he heals Malchus. And then... In John 21, Peter even denies knowing Jesus. There's a little servant girl that says, hey, aren't you one of those followers of Jesus? And he says, and he, with curses and with oaths, he says, I've, I don't know him. Right. And then what really blows my mind is in John 21, Peter sees Jesus crucified, sees Jesus go into the tomb, sees Jesus rise again, sees Jesus in the upper room twice in person, 
the wounds, everything, knows it's Jesus. Jesus says to him, hang loose for a few weeks. We're going to meet in Jerusalem. And Peter says, great. And Peter says, I'm going fishing. He goes back to his old ways. He doesn't wait on the Lord. It could be that. It could be he felt inadequate to serve the Lord. But either way, he didn't trust what Jesus was telling him. And he tried to handle things in an earthly fashion. Okay. But then something happened. Something happened to Peter that enabled him to write this letter. And that was Pentecost. At Pentecost, which is one of the feasts where the Jews all need to come back to Jerusalem and gather and worship and sacrifice and everything, um, he was empowered with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came down upon the disciples and filled them. And when we see the difference of pre-Holy Spirit and post-Holy Spirit, Peter are two different people. And that's the same for us, right? Before we really know Jesus and have him in our lives, we don't have the Holy Spirit in us. And then when we surrender our lives to Christ, that's when the Holy Spirit starts his work in us. He lives in us and he starts his work in us. A couple of examples are from the book of Acts chapter three. Uh, Peter heals a lame man in Jesus name. He says, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness, we made this man walk. He's pointing to the power of God now instead of his own power, right? In Acts chapter four, uh, they're arrested. P uh, James, Peter, and John are arrested. And the Jews, it says, so they called them and commanded them not to speak. So the Jews called Peter and John and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. Remember a little while ago, he was afraid of a little girl, a little servant girl saying, I don't know him. Now he's boasting in Jesus Christ. He's got the confidence. He's got the power. He's got the strength. And he's got the boldness. <clears throat> And they pray for boldness in, uh, a little later in Acts chapter 4. And when they had prayed, they placed uh, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness in Acts chapter 4. Now, this here is nothing that Peter did. You need to understand that this is all God's work, right? And this is nothing less than Jesus just keeping his promises. Amen. Right? If you look at the um, gospel messages in John chapter 14, Jesus says, and I will pray the father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, but it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Jesus is saying that the world, the people who reject him will not have the Holy Spirit, but you will. And in Matthew uh, chapter 10, he, Jesus says, behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, but beware of men for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and Kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about what you should speak or how you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Jesus told them that this was going to happen, and it's happening in the book of Acts. Okay, so this is Jesus just keeping his promises. <clears throat> and I think there's nothing better that exemplifies this than Peter's speech at Pentecost. And that's in Acts chapter 2, uh, 14 to 39. I'm going to look at it briefly. I'm not going to read all of it, but I think there's some highlights from that speech. And if you haven't read this, I urge you to, because it's just so powerful that this buffoon from the gospels that, that would just, he would just, it was like everything he did, Jesus had to correct him. And then all of a sudden he's letting out a speech like this. But uh, the white is Peter's, 
Gold's part, yellow are the um, profits, and red's just the points I want to make. Um, so Peter, it says, but Peter, standing up with the 11, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem. So that's who he's speaking to. That's his audience. Let this be known to you and heed my words, for these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the, about the third hour of the day. It's about nine o'clock in the morning. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he goes in and basically recites the Old Testament. Okay? So the Holy Spirit has basically given him all the material that he needs to say, you Jews know all of this stuff. This is stuff that you, you said you believe in your whole lives. You practice, but you didn't get it. So I'm bringing it to your attention again. And he brings to attention what the prophet Joel says. And he ends up with, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. That's Joel's primary message there. And then Peter goes back to saying, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For, the, the, for David says concerning him, and then he goes into this whole thing about what David said about the Messiah coming. And I'm not going to read all of that to you. You could read it, chapter 2, Acts. But what I like here is what David says. Is he goes, you will make me full of joy in your presence. David knew hundreds of years before Jesus even came that he would be full of joy. He would have everything he needs also, right? <clears throat> and we go right down to the end with David. And then the, the uh, climax of this speech, in, in my opinion, is uh, Peter says, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. That means king and savior, Amen. boss and savior. Okay. And now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? That's a wonderful response. That's what you want to hear. When you're talking to somebody and you're sharing with them the fact that, listen, do you realize that you're a sinner and you can't get to heaven on your own and all the stuff that you tried in the past and all these false teachings that you're following, they're not going to get you to heaven. Do you understand that now? And they say, I get it. What should I do now? And Peter's answer is, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission or forgiveness of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Again, he's saying, unless you do this, unless you have this born again experience and surrender your life truly to God, you will not receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then he winds it up with saying, for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord will, God will call. He's talking about the Gentiles here, people who are non-Jews. That's mostly us. Uh, and, and it's been happening for centuries that he's still calling us to, to his family. So I think that was a very powerful um, sermon. And we get to see Peter transform from this not so eloquent speaker into, into this. So we're going to take these apart uh, pretty briefly. I thought I was actually going to spend all my time on this section, but God had other, other plans for my message, I guess. Uh, so Simon Peter, verses 1 and 2. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So, again, we need to look at, uh, in context, who's he writing to? He's writing to those who have obtained like precious faith, people who gave their lives to Christ. That's who he's writing to, as I mentioned earlier. Now, I'm bringing this up because, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of faces that I've been seeing, whether it be on camera when I'm watching remotely or, or I'm here, 
to some faces that I've, I've, I've seen come into this church that I don't really know you. And I'm, I apologize for that. Um, and I don't know what your, what your relationship with the Lord is. So, and I apologize for that. So I wanted to just make sure that we understood really what salvation means. And salvation is a three-step process. It's a three-part process, okay? The first is what's called justification. This is past tense. This is a position in Christ. This is when we become part of God's family, heirs to the throne, basically. And this is when we have been saved from the penalty of sin. And I've been talking about that a lot, where we, we understand we're sinners, we surrender our lives to Christ, we say we need a Savior, and we ask Jesus to be that Savior. Boom. We are justified with God. And the scripture to pack that, pack, back that up is Romans 5.1 that says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? That's a one-time deal. That's a work that God does in us. Okay? The next part is sanctification. Sanctification is a present tense. It's progressive. It, it's where my condition is becoming like Christ. We are being saved from the power of sin. So first, when we're justified and we ask Jesus to be our Savior, we're saved from the penalty of sin. Now, as we're growing in Christ, we are being saved from the power of sin. It doesn't have the hold on us that it used to have. We're able to fight it better. We're able to, uh, when we do sin, we, we know that we have an advocate in Jesus Christ. We, so we confess it to each other. We seek each other for help. Whatever we need to do to overcome this sin. And the, the scripture to back that up is Hebrews 14, 3, that says, For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. It's an ongoing process. This is a work of God. It's also a work of us. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. And I'm probably going to get some nasty emails on that statement. <laughs> I'm ready. Come on. So <laughs> and the third step is glorification. And that's a future tense, okay? That's permanent. That's when we will be like Christ. So the first step is justification. When we are saved, the second step is sanctification. We are being saved. And then glorification is when we are saved and we become like Christ. And that's when we are saved from the presence of sin because that's when we're in heaven in perfected bodies and there is no sin in heaven. God does not allow sin in his presence, okay? That's why he had Adam and Eve leave the garden from the beginning. And the scripture that talks about that is Philippians 3.21. The Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. <clears throat> so I hope you understand. And if you don't, if you have questions about that, see me, see Carl, Elder Carl, or anybody else in this room. We'll, we'd love to be able to talk to you with that um, if you need help with that. Verses 3 and 4. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust. <clears throat> these all things, and, I, and I've, I've preached on this before, but... Um, God has filled us. He's given us everything we need. And if we look at Ephesians chapter one, uh, verse three says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. It's a done deal. He did it. When we surrendered our lives to Christ, he blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Um, if you look at Ephesians chapter one, uh, I think it's up to about verse 11, you'll see about seven blessings outlined. And you got to look for them. But there's like seven blessings there that shows us that we have everything we need for this life, for life and godliness. And another interpretation I've, I've seen um, some of these commentators do, it says life and godliness in the scripture. But there are some interpreters that, that put it as life of godliness, which... I think they're kind of synonymous. And these promises that he talks about, these great, these exceedingly great and precious promises, again, that's played out in, in Ephesians chapter 1. And Jesus talks about these promises in the Gospels when he's encouraging 
the uh, apostles and he's, and he's writing this for us, that we would have life and we would have it abundantly and that we would have eternal life because the alternate, the alternative is eternal death. There is an eternal death and that's eternal separation from God for those who do reject the gospel message. The divine nature is becoming God's children. We become part of God's family when we, when we become Christians and the Holy Spirit dwells in us. People who do not have the Holy Spirit cannot be part of that divine nature. They don't even understand what the scriptures are really saying. The key to understanding the scriptures is the Holy Spirit interpreting for us and saying, okay, let's unlock that, Mark. Now you know what it means. I remember reading the Bible when I was in my 20s. I'd come home from a night of partying and say, all right, let me see what Jesus has to say. And I pull out one of those little things and I, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I don't know what that means. I've been born again. I know what that means now, you know, and it's true. <clears throat> and it says that we have escaped corruption. And as I mentioned, it says the believer, uh, the believer escapes the power of sin. And that's that whole sanctification process. We're living in a very corrupt world. <laughs> I don't have to say anything about that, but yeah, we're living in a really, really bad, bad time. And you know, we're not the only ones. People throughout history have lived in horrible times. And, and for them, it's the worst time that they've ever gone through. They think it's the worst time in history. We think it's the worst time because we're going through it right now, right? Because we're selfish beings. <laughs> so now we're going to talk about cultivating the fruit. And this is the part that I was concerned about where we might think that it's something, if we read it just on its own, that we need to work to get into heaven or to work to please God to let us into heaven. So as you see in the context, that's not the case. But individually, you can interpret it this way, and you could twist this to mean you got to work to get to heaven. And I'm getting a nod from Johnny D, so I know I'm on the right path here. <laughs> but, <laughs> but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith a virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. And I'm just going to go very brief, briefly over about what these words or statements mean. Diligence, very upfront. The definition is careful and persistent work or effort. The Bible is telling us, yes, we need to work. God saves us, God is saving us, and God glorifies us. But in that process of sanctif sanctification, we need to cooperate with him. We need to be obedient with him. That's the work. And it's growth. It's, it's, it's God filling us and, and us using what God filled us with to become more Christ-like. Faith. When we're born into the family of God through faith in Jesus, we're born complete, it says in Colossians. We're given everything we need for life and godliness. And as Christians, we need to live a life that exemplifies that belief. And we need to continue to grow in all that God has given us. And the scriptures to back that up is Romans 10, 17, 12, 3, and Ephesians 2, 8. I'm not going to go through all of those. You're welcome. <laughs> <clears throat> Virtue. This is actually a difficult word to define in the way we're trying to use it here. But it's, it's a moral excellence. It's fulfilling a purpose. It is exhibiting the character and conduct of Christ while we're here on the earth. It's us being light in a dark world. Okay? And we see that in John 8 and Philippians chapter 4. Knowledge is an intimate knowledge. It's not just knowing about Jesus, that he existed and knowing the story of Jesus, that he existed and died or whatever. It's an intimate knowledge. It's, it's, it, the word knowledge is even used about sexual relations in, in the scriptures for the most part. That's, that's as intimate a knowledge you're going to get. And it's knowledge that is continually growing. Again, it's that process. It comes through obedience to the will of God. Y you get to know God more by if you do what he's directing you to do in the scriptures, and I hate to say it this way, but you see the payoff in your life. You really do. And when, as you get to see that you can trust God more and more, 
the more you're going to want to obey him and do what he tells you and say, you know what? I, I, I agree. Like my, our parents, right? They always had what was, they always wanted what was in best for us. We didn't believe him and we disobeyed him. But, when, but the times that we did obey them and they were right, we were like, huh, you know, uh, I'm 53 years old now. My father's been gone over a year and a half and I still look back and say, man, he was right about that when I was 18. How do you know, you know? <laughs> Continuing the same verses, five to seven, we look at self-control. This is discipline. Yeah. It's probably the biggest thing most of us have trouble with, right? Yeah. It's self-discipline. Paul compares the Christian to an athlete because an athlete needs to be very disciplined to be successful. I mean, you know, a, a, a hundredth of a second could be, be a gold medal versus a, a coming in fourth in, in the Olympics or something like that. We also could look at a musician. Musicians are very disciplined. Right, Rocco? <laughs> right, Rocco? <laughs> this, this deals with the pleasures of life, okay? And we see that in a number of scriptures. But if you really want to look at it, you can say, <laughs> yeah, thank you, Rocco. <laughs> he was in the overflow room making sure everything's going good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you look at the stories of Joseph from the end of Genesis to um, Samson in um, Judges. I think it's 13, 14, 15, if I'm not mistaken. But Joseph had every opportunity to indulge in the flesh, and he practiced that self-control and did not, whereas Samson went looking for it everywhere he could find it. So you read those two stories, and you see opposing views of self-control. <clears throat> Perseverance is patience. It's the ability to endure when life becomes difficult, and it deals with the pressures and problems of life. And we see, you know, we can read that up in James and 2 Corinthians, but Job is a really good example. Um, I've spoken about Job before, and it's 43 chapters, so I'm not going to talk about it right now. I've got about 10 or 15 minutes left, so um, you're welcome on that too. <laughs> but Job is a, is a situation where um, he suffers, and he asks God why he's suffering, and ultimately he, he just trusts God through the whole thing, and he perseveres through it, but he never sins with his lips against God. And that's the important part. <clears throat> and godliness is a proper response to the things of God, which produce obedience and righteous living. It's somebody taking the hard road versus the easy road to avoid trials. It's honoring God instead of taking the easy way out. And I think about Jesus with that, right? He could have taken the easy road and the devil tempted him. And he said, no, I'm going to do what the father tells me to do. Brotherly kindness, the word is phileo. It's where we love because of our likeness to others, okay? Uh, let's see. Uh, hey, you, you ride a motorcycle? Yeah. You love Jesus? Yeah. All right, well, let's ride motorcycles and love Jesus. Come on, right? <laughs> you play guitar? Yeah. I, I, I play guitar. And me too. You like Jesus? Yeah. Let's play guitar and love Jesus. That's that likeness, that fellowship that you have, right? That, that familiarity with each other. But love this ag word agape is we love in spite of the differences we have. Okay. And let me tell you over the years, there have been people who have come into the church that I've met and I had a trouble, I had trouble with the phileo portion. <laughs> I'm being honest. And they had trouble with me with the phileo. I'm not perfect. And what I did was I, I used the agape. I'm commanded to love my brother as myself, right? That's what the scripture says. So I would still meet the needs. I would still honor them and, and honor the Lord and all of my actions towards them. Didn't mean I liked them, but I did love them. And then what I noticed is as, as the, you like that, huh, Merle? <laughs> as, <laughs> as, as, the, as the agape, as I was honoring God with the agape, the phileo was growing. I was actually able to tolerate these people a little more and even started to like them. It's just amazing the work that God can do in us if we surrender to his will. That obedience that I was talking about. I won't mention names. So, so the thing is this. If, if this scripture tells us that we've been given everything we need, why are we adding? What are we adding? How are we adding? Right? Again, it's a sanctification process. Think about this. You pull into a gas station in another state, because Jersey, you don't pump your own gas. 
You pull into a gas station. You pull up to the pump. You open your little trap door. You take your little cap off. You take the nozzle out. You put it in your tank. You put your credit card in. You tell them how much you want. And you stand there. <laughs> What's happening? Nothing, right? We need to pull the trigger. We need to take that action. We need to just take that little step of pulling the trigger to make sure that what, everything we need, all that gas, those 5,000 gallons or whatever is in, in the ground, can get into our tank. Everybody did their job to get that gas ready for us. There was a tanker that got it there, the oil companies, the gas station owner, the credit card company that could take our money, right? right. Every, every, we had everything we need, but we needed to take a little step, a little action. And that's what the sanctification process is like. God's given us everything. It's all there. We just need to access it. We need to take a little bit of action and put, put things into action. Because we're able to do this because we have the same spirit that Peter received on Pentecost. We have everything we need for life and godliness. Verses 8 and 9, For if these things are yours and abound or grow, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed of his old sins. <clears throat> this knowledge, again, I talked about it a minute ago. It's an intimate knowledge of what God's will is for your life and then actually doing it, right? Jesus says in John 14, if you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then he throws in a second one. He said, and the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then later on, he says, you know, I call you friends now. And he says, love one another as I have loved you. Amen. And Christ died for us. That's how he loved us. <clears throat> Now, he talks about he who lacks these things. This could be taken as a saved person or an unsaved person, but I don't believe that to be the case. I believe it's a saved person with a lazy walk, maybe one of those let go and let God type of people. Because the scripture, the verse says, he has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. And the only way to be cleansed from your old sins is to surrender your life to Christ. That's when you're forgiven of your sins. So this is a person that may have given his life to Christ and then is backsliding or the fruit is not on a tree, right? Jesus says, well, no Christians will know uh, that you're Christians by the fruit on your tree. So if there's no fruit or the fruit is rotten or, you know, we're seeing a brother or a sister, you know, uh, coming out of a bar three nights a week or, you know, they're not, they, they all of a sudden stop fellowship. They're not coming around to church anymore or um, whatever the case is that, that the, the actions in their lives are not consistent with the statement out of their mouth that they believe Jesus Christ, that they follow Jesus Christ. We are encouraged to reach out to them and pull them back. There's 50, over 50 references to what they call the one another's in the new testament and we're to exhort one another encourage one another rebuke one another correct one another pray for one another all of those <clears throat> so uh, we're going to talk about this briefly and then it winds up with therefore brethren be even more diligent to make your call and election sure for if you do these things you will never stumble for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> you can write volumes, and people have written volumes about who's doing the work here. Is it God? Is it man? There's, there's this side of it, and there's this side of it. And Pastor David, from the day I, I, I've been working with him, has really taught me, and I hope you, that, about the balance that's in the Bible. We need to read the Bible knowing that there's a balance there's, in a number of things. I won't get into all of that now, but there's a balance. And if we read a scripture like Philippians, it says, he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's God doing the work, and I don't deny that. But if you read 
chapter 2, which is the same letter to the same people, it says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So my question is, is it God? Is it man? The answer is yes. Yes. That's what the scripture says. I'm not, that's not my opinion. And I, I believe, folks, it all begins with self-examination, okay? We do need to look at ourselves continually. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 40 says, let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. If you, if you listen to the words and not just sing them, that were in a lot of those worship songs, one of them was that we return to the Lord. And we need to examine ourselves because we walk away. God never moves. Jesus never moves. The Holy Spirit doesn't leave us. We don't have this much Holy Spirit one day and then this much the next, and then we do bad things and we have this much the next day. We are full of the Holy Spirit. We're the ones who walk away. We need to look at ourselves and say, how's my walk? How am I doing? Right? <clears throat> now we've got, we're going to recap here. In this scripture, in this passage that I, that I gave to you today, there were four promises. That you may be partakers of the divine nature. Meaning you may have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. That you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to have an intimate knowledge with him. You're going to grow. You know, there's, there's like, as my wife and I get older and we're, we're spending more time together and everything, we know each other better and better. Right? Doesn't always look pretty, but, <laughs> but we certainly do know each other better and better. And we grow because of that. And we, I can kind of anticipate what she would want from me and do that as a blessing to her. And she does the same for me. Number three is you will never stumble. Does that mean you will never sin? No. The scripture is very clear. First John talks about, it says, if you say that you have no sin in you, you are a liar and the truth is not in you. And 1 John also says that, if, that when we do sin, we have an advocate in Jesus Christ, okay? This stumbling is in our faith. It's a stumble because don't forget, he's talking to people that were questioning their faith. They were questioning their salvation. So he's saying, if you do all these things, if you just keep looking at yourself and, and, and just connecting with God and, 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 and doing what he tells you to do and, and trust in him, you will never stumble, so we have that promise. And then he promises us an entry into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's not saying that we're going to lose our salvation if we don't do these things. He's saying that it's going to be a cool party when we get there. One condition. If you do these things. Amen. Right? So now we know what these things are. Now, listen, you might be sitting here or you might be out in YouTube world or wherever you are, um, and, and, or you, I don't know where you might be hearing this, and somebody may listen to this recording five years from now. <laughs> I doubt it. But <laughs> somebody might be listening to this recording at some point or whatever, and they may hear this and say, listen, I don't have that relationship with Jesus Christ. I haven't surrendered my life to Christ. I don't, I'm still kind of doing what I used to do when I, what I grew up with. And, and what do I do here? And that that's, could be a scary notion. Yeah. Well, I have some good news. The good news is you're still alive. Right? The good news is that you still have the opportunity to, to surrender your life to Christ the right way. Amen. To have that born again experience. John 6, 29 says, Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he sent. You simply need to accept the free gift of grace. God reaches out to you and you say, thank you, Lord. Yes, I'm, I'm broken. I need help. I need, I need a savior. Acts 16.30, and he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's believing what God tells us, that he was raised from the dead for our sins. And then in Romans 10, 9, it says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus 
and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's important, right? Because it says it believe in your heart. God knows our heart. I have no idea what's in any of your hearts. I can't judge if you're saved or not. And nobody should be judging if you're saved. We can see the fruit on your tree. But God truly knows your heart if you're saved or not. So when you reach out to God, you know, there's, there's a lot of people who say, yeah, yeah, I know Jesus. I'm, uh, you know, whatever. And then I see, there, I see rotten fruit, put it that way. Um, those are people that I'm not sure where their heart is. And I, I'm not going to judge them, but I'll let God take care of that. But it's important that you just understand that you can't say, yeah, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm okay. I, I look at the thief on the cross right before Jesus died. He was up on the, the cross with the two thieves and they were mocking him. And the one thief right at the end says, Lord, remember me when you enter your kingdom. And Jesus says, today I tell you, you will be in paradise with me. Right? Jesus knew his heart. Amen. Because a lot of us might have that attitude of saying, you know, I'll live my life any way I want. And then at the end, I'll say, all right, Jesus, I'm here. <laughs> Jesus, God knows our heart. Right. We're going to close. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. Folks, I, I thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, bring God's word to you. Um, I hope I did it honor and justice. And uh, yeah. we're going to, oh, sorry, brother. We're just going to pray and, and let the worship team do their thing. And these guys are amazing, aren't they? God bless you guys. Father, we just thank you for this time together. We thank you for the message that you prepared in our hearts, in my heart. I hope, I pray, Lord, that it was, was administered with the love that it was intended and, and um, that it really spoke to some people that needed to hear it. Uh, we love you, Lord. We, we want to honor you in all that we do. Um, we fail at that so many times but yet you love us anyway. Your grace and your mercy just abound, and your forgiveness is undying. Uh, we're just so grateful, Lord, even in the times we don't act like it. And we just want to thank you for all your blessings, Lord. So many blessings that we're aware of, but yet there's so much behind the scenes that you're doing, blessing us that we're not even aware of. And we want to thank you for those too. And we ask you to go before us and bless our week ahead in your holy name. Amen. Amen.